and welcome to episode number 14 of What Sex Got to Do With It, where we're talking about chapter 13. The reason that we're one chapter behind is because we started the first episode with doing the acknowledgments, so I hope someone, I hope that you will go and check that episode, because that was, um, that was the first and really good one, uh, but I'm here with my favorite <laughs> great grandmother in, in, in all the solar system, and I tell you, the James Webb Telescope has been like scanning the solar system. Oh. Yeah, and and you're it, you're <laughs> it. <laughs> so, so, so this chapter is called um, "Talking Sense to a Species with All the Answers." Yeah, and and the origin of that chapter title uh, is the difficulty that it is to give a hard truth to a species that's as good at rationalizing its behavior as we are. And we are genius at it. We're really, really good at telling ourselves that what we, what benefits us personally, really is good for everybody. And we're we're very good at denying um, the benefits of the privileges we've had in our lives. We all want to believe that we've worked hard for what we have, and. To be told, wait, 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 your brain is a tricky little creature there and it's not always telling you the truth. So that's why it's hard to talk to a species with all the answers. I can't we're, we're clever. Yep, yep, I thought that's where you're headed, but you know, I, I like what the pattern that we have here. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of nice to just understand what's going through mm -hmm. the author's head and as she and, um, came up with it. You know? So, so well, as with chapter 12, you know, you know I'm going to be bouncing around a lot because there's just a lot of good writing here and got some ideas that and sparked a lot of questions for me. Uh, so let's talk about um, eugenics, you know, and mm. you just say how you know, that is, you know, well, let's just say not a good idea, you know, mm. short-sighted, you know. Uh, I just want to understand though what you mean by eugenics because a you know, uh, do you consider that when we do gene editing to cure disease, eugenics? Uh, not to cure disease. Right. I think we have to be careful when we do gene editing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I'm in favor of a lot of it. Yeah. Like I was really excited to hear that there's uh, some possibility to treat some really awful diseases yeah. through gene editing. But the kind of um, thing that I, we don't, the variability in our genome is one of our strengths. Mm -hmm. It's one of the wonderful things about sexual mm -hmm. reproduction. Not all the traits that we carry are expressed at any time. As you know, the dominant, the recessive traits. So there's, uh, it, we can adapt, we're nimble on our feet, we can adapt more quickly should we suddenly be presented with a new challenge. Um, and, and I think they're happening all the time. Uh, um, and we don't really yet know what genes we might have to rely on in the future. So to use gene editing in a way, for example, I, in one of the science book club discussions, someone was saying, oh, well, you know, with gene editing in just a few generations, everyone can have IQs over 200. And I'm thinking, what a horrible thing to to select just for intelligence. Who decides what's needed? Do we want us to be ever more clever at denying our own responsibility for things? Um, so I think there's a danger. Uh, those who are doing the editing tend to want the genes that they carry, you know, to value the traits that they have, super intelligence, certainly people who are, uh, you know, so I think we have to be careful not to put value judgments on genetic variability. You certainly I'm opposed to disease, things that cause suffering and hardship, but we don't yet we don't yet know what traits we might really need. So so uh, let's make sure we preserve genetic variability. I think that's really important. Right. But this is so I, I was maybe thinking that the difference though between being treating disease being um, and eugenics is that eugenics happens before birth and, and treating disease, or before, or not even, I guess you could even say it's not necessarily before birth because to the extent that you 
determine that there was something mean, that is affecting the embryo mean, or the fetus mean, um, that it was better treated sooner rather than later. Uh, the, the, I mean, I, I kind of tussle with me, me fixing something me versus designing selecting something. For it. Yeah, yeah. There's a difference it, between yeah. fixing and designing. Yeah. You know, the 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 Japanese geneticist or Chinese was he? I forget. I think he was maybe Chinese. I forget. Oh. Who? Um, what did he do in uh, with embryo implants? He did some kind of gene editing that made the children. Immune yeah, to, to was it was it AIDS I or, think it was HIV or, something I, like or that. HIV yeah. I think, and just outrage about that. First of all, he right. did it with because there are guidelines against right, right. doing he that kind of thing. Yeah. He wasn't curing; he was trying to impose a future immunity right. to something, and that's going to be heritable now. They'll pass that down to their offspring probably. So, and not sure what else it might, you know, it was done without enough knowledge and right. with not enough consensus around it. And I think we have to be really, re really careful about playing God. I'm very, I'm thrilled when diseases are able to be corrected. I mean, cystic fibrosis, um, diabetes, all kinds of things that, that perhaps they can do gene editing, um, you know, CRISPR techniques to correct for diseases. I mean, I'm in favor of preventing uh, suffering. I'm very opposed to creating a master race. You know, I, uh, the, the superhuman being, all children are beautiful, all children are healthy. You know, I happen to really love human variability. I am enchanted by neurological variability, how differently we see the world without realizing necessarily that we're not seeing it quite the same way everyone else is. So I would hate, I hate the idea of designer <laughs> babies, quite frankly. I really, uh, that makes, I, I think we would lose so much more than we would gain. Okay. And uh, so, but I, I, you know, I want to prevent suffering, right. and, but preserve variability. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, 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 definitely. I'm just exploring some. some yeah, no, it, you know, so the, you, the, the discussion. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, no, no. This, we're not advocating for this or for yeah, that. Right. We're kind of, and it's important to just kind of think about how you feel, yeah. and maybe I'll go home and think, oh, no, 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 no. Did I say that wrong? Do I really mean that? Right. So, yeah. the dialogue with right. other humans is always important. So let's zip ahead me okay. a hundred thousand, a million um, generations from now. And, and without any eugenics, and, uh, uh, we now find ourselves with species with less variation. And, and someone says, you know what, I mean, we can increase the variation, and, uh, but we have to do it, of course, genetically. And, uh, uh, what would you think then? Well, first of all, I think you're unbelievably optimistic to assume that humans are still going to be around more than, I don't know. You think, I, you know so, so yeah. we have limited time here. Let's go with my premise. We go with your premise? No. Um, I, well, I, you know, I think human reproductive behavior produces variability and and mutations occur spontaneously yeah. and I think if you if you if you want more variability that suddenly you have a species without variability with less, just less with just less, less. Quit, if, if, if it's if it has less because it's been crispered out of us no 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 just just be, I said no there's been no 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 genetic manipulation by oh people. I think variability is good I, I you know, I because it it gives you it prepares you in advance for circumstances that you can't foresee. It gives you genetic options that you might not be using now, but that might be useful in the future. As I say, I'm I am personally biased in favor of a lot of variability. Yeah. I I. Uh, yeah, I was just trying to get at me how we how I was just trying. To tease out whether there might be a case where you feel that us humans can go in, you know, and do stuff you know, with, with the genome, with the intention, you know, of doing good, you know, so, because, because you just, yeah, go ahead. I, 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 I'm, 
I want to be cautious about messing with Mother Nature. Who defines what good is? You know, that's that's scary, scary stuff. Uh, you know, I, the sociologists were sociobiologists were accused of being eugenicists, which I always found to be a completely ridiculous claim. Um, because I never met a sociobiologist who was a eugenicist. Right. Um, all the sociobiologists were trying to do was establish that genetics is as important, you know, has is a factor in human behavior as well as uh, cultural, you know, nature nurture both matter. Right. That's all that uh, sociobiology or what is now called evolutionary psychology yeah. is trying to establish. Um, uh, this this wanting to design uh, makes me very very nervous because the those who are in charge of designing always value the traits that they happen to have and they tend to want to create humans in their own image and mm -mm. but if that weren't the case what do you mean if it if, if they if it was the case that they didn't want to design necessarily in their own image and that they were uh, uh, more focused on variability. Well, what I know of human nature right. makes me hard to believe that that would be possible. All right, all right. Yeah. So, so um, you you um, you say we'll successfully solve our problems only when we learn to make our shared humanity the source of the feel-good sense of belonging that is one of the rewards of group membership. And I like this insight because for me, it's a part of redefining the self. Mm -hmm. you know? And my, my notions are, uh, one of my notions is that uh, there is really no such thing as altruism because no one does anything unless they perceive it as being relatively beneficial to themselves. Mm -hmm. You just have to redefine the self. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the self mm -hmm. is more than just you, it's really mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I've always like said that it, I, I mean, you and I are very much on the same page yeah. here, altruism if you look at it closely, it's always driven by something that makes you feel good. Right. And if you're programmed to feel, I mean, even um, I grew up in a rather, in a family where there was a, you know, my parents fought a lot, a lot of tension in the family. I have really learned to want everybody to be happy. That's not because I'm an altruist. It's because if everybody's not happy, I'm going to be feeling pain. Right. And so that's not altruistic for me to want everybody to be happy. Right. I'm trying to avoid the personal anguish and pain that comes when there's chaos. So I think that's speaking to what right. you're talking so about. So now the question is, how do we increase that sense of belonging and get people to you know, realize that that creates the, the good feeling? I, I think, uh, Len, part of it is understanding that we're a, terrific, a horribly tribal species and thinking about, again, our origin of species being a chromosome fusion. I suspect that that's one reason we're so terrifically tribal, because we would have had to be looking for others just like us, so we're not going to be successful in reproducing the kind of thing you were talking out at earlier. So we're, unless we're drawn to others that look very much like us or seem like part of our tribe, we're not going to, that's not going to get programmed in because we're not going to reproduce um, um, successfully. So we have to get, we have to understand our tribalism is complete bunkum. It's just nonsense. But it feels good to feel like you belong to a group. These are, this is my team. I'm part of this. I'm not like them. But we have to recognize that has, it's that kind of feeling has its origins in very, primitive biological directives. And we can imagine if suddenly you feel like you're in everybody's tribe, how good it, you know, it just expands your, your feel good sense if you drop some of those artificial constructs of other. Right. You know, right. we're the us and them species. Right. We're so good at saying, oh, he's other, she's other, this is who I'm. It makes me feel good. And even to belong to uh, a, a tribe that's known real and horrible discrimination, it still helps form your sense of identity. And I, so I think we have to learn, or I hope we can learn, and I think we can, uh, just through the course of my life, you know, I learned to shed biases that I've had. And so we do learn to shed them. And my 
sense of joy and happiness just dramatically increases the more people I'm able to identify with and feel, oh yeah, I know why that person, yeah, that person and I have a lot in common, or even, oh wow, that person is different. How much fun it's going to be to find out about the way they see the world. Right. You know, that, that's, it's like an exploration of unknown territory. Right. And so I, you know, I really hope, I, I view tribalism and greed as the, just the two most awful of our species-specific traits, two that I really hope we can rise above. I think those two we can rise above. And I think we're successfully doing it. But it's, what we, what we gain in one area we seem, I mean, now it's political divides that we seize on. What nonsense that is. You know, we all are interested in the same outcomes. Mostly all people want the same things. We, you know, we're a combination of, I had this epiphany the other morning. There'd been a death in the family and I was trying to sort out how I felt about the person who died and the complicated nature of our relationship. And so in processing my grief, it wasn't just straight line grief. Right. Um, I love the bird song wakes me in the morning in Arlington. We're so far east yeah. in our time zone. The birds start murmuring around 3.30. Yes, They're they now do. slowing down a yes, little bit, but yes. certainly by four. So yes. I have a condo on the fourth floor and it's no windows, but great big skylights. And my bedroom is very small. The skylight over my bed is almost as big as my bed and I throw it open wide. It's like sleeping outside. So there's a rain gutter under the open um, skylight and then Northern Mockingbird sang me awake at 4 or 4.30. It was like a symphony, just uh -huh. the most gorgeous, gorgeous. And it's when I'm trying to process my grief, and I just had this epiphany. We are all a result of our, the genes we were born with and the experiences that we've had in life. All any of us want is to love and be loved. No one sets out to deliberately make someone else unhappy. And I just absolutely believe that. And as soon as I, I realize, oh, I do believe that, and of course no one is deliberately trying to torture me, it's, or to put me down, or to make me feel less than I am. And each person is just trying to find love for themselves and to be able to love, but they're constrained by their genetic component and and the experiences that they've yeah. had in life. Yeah. Right. Well, well, no, well, I agree, you know, and, and, and essentially what made it easier for me to deal uh, with, uh, let's just say, um, challenging interactions uh, with people is that it isn't that people, my, my insight was that it's not that people you know, do what they can, they don't do what they can't do. Oh, interesting. And that made me. Oh, that's and interesting. And so, and so, like when you say, well, "Why don't they just?" And yeah. it's like, "Well, they can't." Yeah, yeah. They, know, don't they, do they, they don't do what they can't. They don't do what they can't do. You know, and, and so, and I don't do what I can't do. I mean, like, yeah. there are but, times when I just don't have patience. And it's like I can wish I have patience all I wanted. I don't have it. But you know, the, but I, the, I, I, the, I, to get back to your thing right. of positive reinforcement, I yeah. I loved my first mother-in-law. I, isn't that funny? I just adored that mo mother-in-law, <laughs> the rare daughter-in-law. I, th I've not ever in my life known a perfect person, but my mother-in-law, Mother Fowler, was as close to a perfect person as I've ever known. And she had an old-fashioned Pennsylvania expression, Dutch expression that she used, Pennsylvania Dutch expression. You get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Yes. And that goes back to what you were talking yes. about, positive reinforcement. Right, right. So there are people, use your expression again, I like that. People don't. Do what they, they do what they can, but they don't do what they can't, they can't do. do. Yeah. But we can help people learn to do what they can't do by offering positive reinforcement as they begin to approach yeah, yeah, but what would make yeah. their life happy, yeah. ultimately make their life happier. Mm -hmm. When I meet a really difficult person, and let's face it, there are some people like that in the world, I often think, oh, I would hate to live in his skin. Right. I would hate to live in his skin. It must be awful to feel like the world is attacking you and after you and... Uh, yes, except that there is, as you mentioned, 
me some um, positive feelings that come from victimhood. You know, you kind of mentioned it in this chapter. I have to scroll back down, but you you, you mentioned something about the the empowerment people kind of get from, from feeling from well because you feel like you're part of a tribe. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. For example, yeah. when I hear people complaining about being a victim as a result of this, that, and right. the other. I have to bite my tongue to keep from saying, well, what do you think? Don't you think women have known discrimination yeah. too? Uh, you know, so my fallback then is to feel, hey, well, I belong to a tribe that's yeah. been victimized. Or right. what do you think? Yeah. You don't think old white women yeah. or, or yeah. Women, old women with white hair yeah. get diminished and not yeah. taken seriously? Yeah. So we do fall back on, yeah. okay, yeah. but I'm on a tribe that, yeah. and, and yeah. I have that sense of, oh, yeah. but I belong to a group that's yeah. been victimized too. Yeah. So we, it's a sense of identity. Yes, yes, and, and, and it, 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 um, it, it and, and feeling victimized is also being one of the contributors to people feeling angry. Mm -hmm. And angry, being, people being angry actually, you know, um, feel powerful. In fact, Jennifer Lerner, me from the Kennedy School, uh, did this paper um, called "You Know." Um, we had to do with anger, you know, and 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 it was essentially how we people, you know, the anger just really makes them feel good, you know, and and they feel because what it does is it makes them feel certain. And, and it's also feel, a yeah, lot of a yeah. lot of endorphins yeah, yeah, uh, get released in right. in a, in, a, in, a, in an outburst of anger. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and and so they then feel that uh, they know who has created the problem for them, and, and so it's a sense of of um, feeling um, it's victimized. You know, yeah, it's uh, interesting. But uh, you were talking about how uh, uh, we see the other uh, as a result you know, of this potential. Um, Changing the chromosome, you know, where we were then looking for you know, other individuals, you know, but I'll posit that it goes further back than that because it's it's that the you need the other for existence. I mean, mm -hmm. just just going back to physics, I mean, it's like you, know, you can't have one without the other. You know, I mean, so I know it's kind of like the Chinese yin yang thing, but mm -hmm. it requires two. You know, and so there's always going to be a difference. I mean, and 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 it's how those come together. You know, that creates another. You know, uh, that it is kind of the base of, of existence. So that's why I feel that we, we actually kind of have to go beyond just like understanding the just human nature. I mean, but also kind of understanding the the space in which humans exist in, in order to understand the effects that kind of existence has on us and, and, and so so and, and part of the, what I'm really getting at is that we kind of learn to embrace the differences because what humans are very good at is discerning differences mm, oh you know, we are yes. you know, and, and so even if you have everyone the same race yeah. oh, like we're going to oh, figure out oh, you know, oh, how, oh, how we differ oh you know? oh um, oh absolutely yeah. Uh, yeah we find we find I have curly hair you have straight hair um, right you know, I now, when I'm in a crowd, I notice people with white curly hair and I chuckle to myself, how come you you were drawn to that person? Oh, my tribe, that person's in my tribe, white curly hair. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't ascribe value to it, but I am aware that's what what I notice. But Len, I'll go even a little further than yeah. you do. All right. I think not only do we have to begin to see ourselves as as part of this whole network of humans, but this whole network of life on the planet. And that's very comforting to me, to feel a part. I'm part of, of, of an evolved system of interdependence. We all need each other. Although I have, I just said in an earlier episode, uh, you know, we need the honeybees more than the honeybees need us. And I, I do believe that. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure how much the honeybees do need us, except that we plant flowers that they like because we want to harvest their honey. So there is this interdependence with all life on this planet. And I think as, as I get older and I'm aware that my own boundaries will dissolve in the not too distant future, although if I'm aiming to be a great great grandmother, you know, it might, might be the longer future than. I've allowed myself, but I take comfort in feeling I'm, I will go back to being part 
of that whole network, the interdependence of, of all species with each other. You know, I think I say at one point in the book, um, death begets life in that we die, we decompose, other creatures feed on us, plants grow. Right. I mean, there is, there is right. that cycle right. that um, we're, it, what we are is not really lost. You know, other species will depend on my decaying body. I mean, I, I find comfort in that, I do. And probably more comfort as, as I get to be older and try to figure out what, what is the meaning of it all. And just seeing myself as, as not separate from the whole process, but part of that whole interconnectedness of life. You know, I, or, I, or just existence. Yeah, of, yeah, of existence. Yeah, I so silly. You know, the things that people take comfort from. I take comfort from mockingbirds singing me awake at four a.m. You know, it's, just, it's nautical dawn for them. You know, so yeah, the it's just it's, I I hear them too. You know, uh, so so it yeah uh, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Two and a half minutes in, and there's so many other things I could cover. Be, be certainly, be uh, you talk about how the brain, you know, um, it, how we take shortcuts. You know, but it's just our brains are wired to take mm -hmm. shortcuts. Yep. You know, um, you, you really can't help it. It's like we have, even before the digital age, we had so much information coming through that once you have a pattern, you kind of go, well, that's that's in that pattern. And, uh, and, and I think uh, it's important to recognize we are wired that way, and therefore not always to totally believe what our shortcuts tell us, right. recognize, oh, oh, that may not, you know, I understand why I am that way, I don't want to judge myself for being that way, but it may not serve me well always to do that. I, you know, that's part of what I call rising above our species-specific traits. You know, we're clever enough to know, oh, wait, 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 that's how our brains evolve, but that doesn't mean I have to behave that way. I hear you. So, you know, it, uh, we're going to do our editors a little bit of a favor, and we're going to end this one on time and say that uh, we look forward to the next chapter. Can I scroll down and find it fast enough? Uh, well, it's going to be chapter, yeah, it's going to be chapter 14, and I'll call it Tangled Up in Economics and Evolution. Oh, yes. and, uh, <laughs> okay. and we're headed into the home stretch here. Yeah, you know, we next sure session, are. Hey. There'll be three more chapters, and we'll We'll wrap this up, but it certainly has been a, uh, a lot of fun. Well, know, I so. hope our viewers have as much fun as you and I are having. Yeah, well, they, they get the ticket, too. Yeah, no, but, they, yeah, you know, you know, but you and I are having fun doing this. And, you know, in case we don't have a chance to say it later on, because maybe in one of those other chapters, we're just running out of time. Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, thank you very much, Stacey, and I. Yeah. You know, you've been really great host, Vita, and making uh, this possible. It's really one of the great things about Arlington mm -hmm. and, and, and cable access in general. I mean, so, so if you have an idea, I mean, you, can, you can make it happen. I mean, it can great. I mean, spark all kinds of positive things. So thank you, Heather. Thank you, Simai. Thank you. Thanks for watching.